Welcome to Good Book. I'm Mark Strauss and we are continuing our series we've called History, which is the whole Bible in 18 weeks. We've covered the Old Testament in nine weeks and now we've been going through the New Testament. We're about midway through the New Testament. Uh, we finished um, the Gospels in the New Testament and we've looked at the book of Acts. Uh, we looked at the Gospels, that there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We looked at each of those Gospels. And then we looked at uh, the, the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, then we surveyed the book of Acts, which is written by one of the Gospel writers, written by Luke, that tells the story of how the Gospel went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And then we turned and began looking at the epistles, the New Testament letters. And we saw that there are 13 letters written by the Apostle Paul. We covered Paul's life and letters in two weeks. This week, we come to what we call the general epistles. There are eight letters in the New Testament written by others than Paul. Um, then finally, our last week, we will cover the book of Revelation. So our focus today is on the general epistles. And the general epistles, there are eight of them. Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. All of the general epistles are named after their authors, except for one. James is named after James, of course, 1st and 2nd Peter, named after the author Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, named after John, Jude, who was one of Jesus' half-brothers. Only Hebrews is named after the recipients. The recipients are considered to be Jewish Christians. So we're going to cover the general epistles in two sessions. We're going to look at Hebrews and James today, and then next week we'll look at the um, first and second Peter, first and second, third John, and Jude. We divide it into letters re really directed to Jewish Christians. Hebrews and James seem to be written to Jewish Christians, whereas the rest seem to be focused especially on areas where the predominant number of, of Christians were Gentiles. So that's how kind of an artificial division of the general epistles, um, but, but a division nevertheless. We call them general epistles because unlike the letters of Paul, which are directed to some specific individuals and specific churches, the general epistles seem to have a more general audience. So as I said, today we're going to look at two of those. We're going to have to move quickly as always. We're going to look at Hebrews and James. So let's start with the letter to the Hebrews. Um, our theme you can see there is Christ supreme overall. Uh, the letter to the Hebrews, as the title suggests, is written to a group of, of, of Hebrews or Jews. But these are Jewish Christians. These are Jewish Christians who recognize that Jesus is their Jewish Messiah, that he fulfills the promises given in the Old Testament. They believe that. But under severe persecution now, um, gradually as the church is beginning to separate from Judaism, early on the, the Christians were really viewed as just a sect within Judaism. And Judaism was a respected and honored religion in the Roman Empire. It was a legal religion in the Roman Empire. Sometimes new religions were looked down upon and were even persecuted. So as Christianity began to be seen less and less as just a sect or a group within Judaism, their persecution increased. And many Jewish Christians realized that if they were going to remain loyal to Christ, they would face persecution. If they moved back under the banner of Judaism, they could be protected once again. So there, there was a, a tendency, an inclination to say, is it really worth it? And the letter to the Hebrews is written to a group of Jewish Christians who, because of persecution, because of struggles, um, because of oppression from others, is considering, some of them are considering giving up their faith in Christ and moving back under their previous protection of Judaism. Um, the author calls them not to do that. He says, Christ is the fulfillment of Israel's hopes. Jesus is the only way of salvation. He's the savior of the world, the fulfillment of prophecy. Don't go back. Instead, push forward to perseverance. P push forward to maturity. So that's the overall theme of the, of the letter to the Hebrews. Let's start with the question of authorship. One of the most controversial questions related to Hebrews is authorship. Who wrote it? It's uh, one of the few documents in the New Testament that we don't have traditional authorship applied to it, and we don't have a named author either. Um, Hebrews doesn't say who wrote it, uh, but historically, church tradition, at least half of the church tradition, the church tradition um, in, the, in the West believed that Paul was the author. Um, church tradition elsewhere tended to think that someone else was the author. The author was unknown. 
Now today, almost no scholars consider Paul to be the author, but that has been the traditional perspective. In fact, if you open up a King James version, the classic English version, and turn to the letter to the Hebrews, you'll see something like this. It says the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews, right there in the Bible, it says Paul is the author. Uh, but as I said, virtually no scholars today think Paul wrote Hebrews. Um, there's really pretty strong evidence against Paul as the author. For one thing, none of Paul's other writings are anonymous. Paul always, when he writes a letter, he always names himself as the author. You can see Romans chapter one, verse one, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. The beginning of Galatians, Paul, an apostle. The beginning of Philippians, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. He always names himself. Now, some have suggested, well, maybe he's being anonymous because he's the apostle to the Gentiles and he's writing to Jewish Christians. But if you read the letter, you realize that the, the readers know who the author is. He talks about coming to visit them. He talks about their common friends. So it's only anonymous to us. It wasn't anonymous to the original authors. So the fact that Paul doesn't name himself is, would be very strange. Even more significant, the Greek style of Hebrews is dramatically different from Paul's. The Greek style of Hebrews is some of the finest literary Greek in the New Testament, written by someone who clearly, clearly knows well how to write sort of almost a classical style of Greek. When we read Paul's letters, that's not the kind of Greek we get. Paul writes in a much more conversational, kind of a staccato style, very different than, than the letter to the Hebrews. Perhaps the strongest argument against Paul's authorship is actually something in the content of Hebrews, though. Paul always identifies himself as an apostle, as an eyewitness to Jesus Christ. And so as a first generation Christian, here's an example of that. Galatians chapter one, verse 11, he defends his apostolic authority. Authority is an apostle. He says, I want you to know brothers and sisters that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any human source, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul says, I got this directly from Jesus Christ. Look at the author of Hebrews though. He identifies himself as a second generation Christian. He says in Hebrews 2, 3, this salvation, which was first announced by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So he says he learned this about the salvation of Christ from other Christians who were the eyewitnesses. That couldn't be the apostle Paul. He would identify himself as an eyewitness. So it's highly unlikely Paul wrote Hebrews. So if he did it, who did? Well, we simply don't know. Almost every name in the book has been suggested for Paul. Some have suggested Barnabas. Remember Paul's associate, missionary associate. Barnabas was a Levite, we know. And the letter to the Hebrews talks a lot about the Levitical priesthood and the high priest, which would be in that line. So some have suggested maybe Barnabas wrote it. Some have suggested Luke. In fact, an ancient suggestion, Origen suggested that Luke wrote it for Paul. Then you get Luke's style with Paul's, some of Paul's theology. The problem is much of the he of Hebrews is different than Paul's traditional theology. A third fascinating name is Priscilla, uh, the wife of, of Aquila, who was a, a significant teacher in the early church. Um, some have suggested maybe she's writing anonymously because she's a woman and a woman's writing wouldn't be accepted in that context. But as I said, this is not an anonymous document. Also, there's a participle in in Hebrews that is masculine. So the author seems to be identifying himself as, as a man, but I'd love to have it, it be Priscilla. One of the most popular modern suggestions is Apollos. It was suggested by Martin Luther actually in the 16th century. We know who Apollos was a, was a Christian from Alexandria, Greece, who was clearly very intelligent, well-versed, um, um, a fine Greek orator and probably a fine Greek writer as well. That would kind of fit the character that we see um, in the letter to the Hebrews. In the end, we simply don't know. We'll have to wait to heaven to find out. Uh, Origen, that early church father said it this way. He says, in truth, only God knows who wrote Hebrews. Now, even though we don't know the name, we know a lot about the author by what this, the, the author writes. He is clearly Greek speaking. He writes in a very fine Greek style. He knows Greek fluently, um, clearly well-educated because the vocabulary is a very high register, very high vocabulary, very intelligent person, well-educated. He's almost certainly a Jewish Christian, Jewish in the sense that he, he is so well-steeped in the Old Testament and Jewish tradition. He knows it so well, it's hard to believe that he's a Gentile, a non-Jewish Christian, clearly a Christian because of his 
advocacy of Christ and the supremacy of, of, of Christ. So what else do we know? Well, we know he was a brilliant theologian. There's some ideas in, um, in Hebrews that are very creative and interesting, analogies drawn to who Jesus is. But he also has a deep pastor's heart. He cares deeply for this congregation and he longs for them to stay faithful to Christ and to hold on, to persevere and to mature. So we see that theologian, that brilliance, but we also see that deep care and compassion, that pastor's heart. So that's what we know about the author. What do we know about the recipients to whom this is written? Well, we mentioned before, they're almost certainly Jewish Christians. Um, we know that because the author assumes they know a great deal about the Old Testament. There's all kinds of Old Testament quotes, Old Testament allusions, but not just Old Testament quotes, but also allusions to Jewish traditions that aren't in the Old Testament. For example, the author points out that the, the, the Old Testament law was delivered by angels. That's not something that we ever learn in the Old Testament, but Jewish tradition talks a lot about that. So only someone who's well steeped in that Jewish tradition, perhaps who grew up in it, would, would know that well. So that would suggest again that, that these are Jewish Christians because the author assumes they, they know these things. The author then, probably the most significant and strongest argument is the author warns them not to go back not to return to their old way of life. And his whole argument is the supremacy, the superiority of Christ and the new covenant to the old covenant, that the old covenant was just preparing the way for the new, pointing forward. And, and so to not go back would seem to be not to regress, not to go back to their former state of Judaism. So they seem to be Jewish Christians. That's why the, uh, the letter was called the letter to the Hebrews. Secondly, thing we know for sure about them is they have been persecuted severely in the past. They faced a time in the past of intense persecution. Hebrews 10.32 says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. So they were persecuted in the past, but persevered. However, now here's a third point we know about the recipients is they are in danger of returning their old, to their old life. There are five strong warning passages in Hebrews. Don't go back. There are, there are eternal consequences for giving up the faith, giving up the salvation available for, through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape, escape judgment if we ignore such a great salvation? So he tells them to hold on to persevere. Finally, where are these recipients? Well, we don't know for sure. It's never stated, but probably the most likely guess is they are in Rome. And there's one little tidbit that, that suggests that. For one thing, it seems as though they're in a city, the way the author writes to them. Um, th they've been persecuted. We know the Roman church was heavily persecuted. But then we get this little tidbit in Hebrews 13, 24. It says, greet all your leaders and all God's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Those from Italy, well, they're not in Italy, they're from Italy. So it sounds like these are expatriates who are with the author and are from Italy sending greetings back home. So it's, it's likely, not certain, but likely that, the, the, that these uh, Jewish Christians are in Rome. All right, number three, um, after the recipients, let's look at briefly at the occasion. We've already talked quite a bit about the occasion. The occasion means the life setting and then the purpose for writing. So what have we learned? We've learned they're mostly Jewish Christians. We've learned they're in danger of drifting back to the political and social safety of Judaism. Um, when the author says, don't forsake the assembling of believers together. When I was growing up as a kid, my, my parents would always use that to say, you gotta go to church. We're not supposed to forsake the assembly. And so we have to go to church on Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, then Wednesday night as well. But that's not what that verse means. Forsaking the assembly means leaving the church. Some of these were, were thinking of returning to their old way of life and giving up their faith in Christ. That's what forsaking the assembly. Sorry, parents, you can't use that about um, making your kids go to church. But they are, these, these believers are in danger of drifting back into Judaism. So the purpose then is a call to persevere, a call to persevere um, and to grow into maturity in light of the superiority of Christ's person and work. So let's look at a couple of key themes. We've already been hitting on these themes. I just wanna state the theme, show you the contrast and give you a verse or two in support. Uh, the first central theme we've been talking about this, the superior revelation of the Son how Christ's revelation is greater than all that have come before. 
Here's the opening verses of the book, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is the final and great and fulfill, fulfillment of all the previous revelations. Here's a con contrasting comparison we see throughout uh, the book of Hebrews. Judaism, the, the revelation of the old covenant simply came through human prophets. Um, it was a partial revelation. It was incomplete. It, it wasn't the final revelation. It was the old covenant rather than the new. It was the promise, but it was not yet the fulfillment. Jesus, however, is not, a, not just a prophet, but he is the eternal son of God, the creator of all things. His revelation is not partial, it is complete. He brought not the old covenant, the old covenant which was never adequate to take away sins, but the new covenant which brings true and complete forgiveness of sins. And now the promise has been fulfilled. God's um, promise for, the, for salvation has come to fulfillment in Christ. So the whole book is about Christ as the superior revelation of God, the final revelation of God. Not only is his person superior though, however, his sacrifice is also superior. Here's Hebrews 10, 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, that is Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So Christ as the ultimate high priest is the last and final sacrifice, the only true sacrifice for sins. So once again, here's this comparison. In Judaism, you had a high priest who himself was sinful, who had to offer sacrifices, first of all, for himself. And then he had to repeat these sacrifices because people kept sinning, so they had to keep repeating these sacrifices time and again. And then ultimately, these animal sacrifices could never even take away, take away sins. Jesus, however, came as the perfect high priest. He was sinless, so he didn't have to offer a sacrifice himself. His sacrifice could be for, for others. His sacrifice then is once for all, one sacrifice to pay for sins for all times. And those, that sacrifice was truly efficacious, that is effective. It truly took away sins. It brought true and eternal forgiveness of sins, an eternal covenant uh, where we can truly know God, not just through a human mediator, but we can know God truly. And so in light of the perfect sacrifice of the Son, in light of the perfect and complete revelation of the Son, the, the final theme is to persevere and to mature, to grow into maturity. Hebrews 10, 19 through 23. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Here it is. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. The author says, let's hold on, hold on. Why? Because this faith is the true means of salvation. Let's persevere. Let's grow and mature. This group of believers were stagnating. They weren't maturing. So there's our theme of the epistle, the letter to the Hebrews, Christ supreme over all. When you, when you come to Christ, you come to God's final revelation, true and complete salvation. Anything else leads to destruction. Only Christ is the means of salvation. All right, that's Hebrews, one of our letters. Uh, the next letter we're gonna look at is James, a very different letter in many ways, but also written to Jewish Christians. If Hebrews is heavy on theology, James is heavy on practice, the basics of godly living. How do we turn our words of faith into action? Let's again start with the author. Who is this author? His name is James, obviously. He says that at the very beginning, James 1.1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that raises the question, which James? There are actually a number of Jameses in the New Testament. There's two disciples named James, James, the son of Alphaeus, and then James, the son of Zebedee, who is John the Apostle, who wrote the book of Revelation, right? But there's a third James, and this is almost certainly the author of this letter, and that is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Yes, Jesus had brothers. Some people are shocked and surprised to hear that. But we know from the, the Gospels that after Jesus was born of, of a virgin, obviously Mary and, and Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit and Jesus um, was conceived by, by a vir virgin. He, his birth was normal, but his conception was, was virginal. Um, but Joseph and Mary had a normal marital relationship after that. We know they had at least four, four sons and a number of daughters as well. Here's 
Mark 6, 3, it says, isn't this, that is Jesus, isn't Jesus Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? So we see that there are at least four brothers and this is his sisters are with us as well. Fortunately, we don't know the names. I wish we knew the names of his sisters, but we don't know the names of the sisters, but there are at least two because it's plural. So maybe more sisters as well. So this is a typical big Jewish family with four boys and at least two, maybe more, maybe more girls. So James was a half brother of Jesus. We also know that he did not believe in Jesus during Jesus's lifetime. We see this in John 7, where John mentions, he mentions the, the brothers are questioning Jesus. And then it's, he adds this little narrative comment for even his own brothers did not believe in him. So how did James come to know Christ? Well, he had a resurrection appearance. We know that. Paul mentions that in 1 Corinthians 15. He goes through a long list of those who saw Jesus alive after the resurrection. He says he appeared to Peter, then to the 12 apostles. Then he appeared to James. And this is not one of the 12. It's not one of those other Jameses. This is clearly his brother, James. Then to all of the apostles, that is all those, the, those other followers who had been commissioned by Christ. So we know that James saw the resurrected Christ. That led him to faith. And he became then a key leader in the Jerusalem church. James shows up on several occasions in the book of Acts as, as a key leader. In fact, he's, he's probably the senior elder in the, the body of elders in the church in Jerusalem. We know that because in what we call the Council of Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 15, a key debate and council to determine how Gentiles could be saved, whether they need to first become Jewish. James is the one who rendered the final decision. So he seems to be sort of the, 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 the lead elder in this board of elders in the church in Jerusalem. So became a key leader. He shows up, as I said, several times there. So that's the author, James, the half-brother of Jesus and leader in the Jerusalem church. Who are the recipients? Well, it's interesting. The first verse says, James, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. The 12 tribes, well, immediately we hear 12 tribes. You know what that means. That means Jews or Israelites. That's the 12 tribes of Israel. But James is writing, is clearly writing to Christians. So almost certainly these are Jewish Christians that he's writing to. And he's writing to Jewish Christians who are scattered among the nations. What does that mean? Well, that word scattered is the word diaspora, which is the term used for Jews that were outside of Israel. So what does that mean? Probably he's, he's writing to the true remnant of Israel. That is those who, are, who, who follow God by accepting Jesus as the Messiah. And they're scattered. Well, we know in Acts chapter 8 that after the martyrdom of Stephen, Christians were scattered all over. They had, many Christians had to leave Israel. So James, as this kind of lead elder or pastor in Jerusalem, is writing to his scattered flock, his scattered congregation. That would make a lot of sense. So you can see, James writes as pastor to his scattered congregation. Now, we don't know for sure this is the, the dispersion he's referring to, but it's possible. Uh, this would suggest then that James is in Jerusalem writing to these the, the 12 tribes scattered, the 12 tribes of Jewish Christians that is scattered all around. All right, how about the date? When was James written? Uh, we mention this because some think James is the earliest of the letters in the New Testament, perhaps the earliest document in the New Testament, written even in the mid-40s, which would be significantly before most of the letters or all of the letters of Paul and significantly before the Gospels as well. Why do we think this? Well, he, it appears to address only Jewish Christians. That would suggest that the Gentile mission, maybe the men, mission to the Gentiles is just getting started. Interestingly, he uses the word synagogue for the gathering or synagogue means gathering or assembly of Christians. Well, that's a Jewish term. So he's still using Jewish terms to refer to Christians. There's also no reference to the Jerusalem council. Now that Jerusalem council made this key decision related to the salvation of the Gentiles. And you might expect James to appeal to that in this letter since he talks about the idea of faith and works and, and how people are saved. He doesn't refer to that. So it's it's possible it's before the Jerusalem Council, which was in about AD 49 or 50, sometime around there. So we don't know for sure, but possibly a very early letter, the, maybe the earliest letter we have from the Jerusalem church. Here's a couple of characteristics of James. James, as we've said, a very Jewish epistle. There's many allusions to the Old Testament. There's also a lot of parallels to what we call wisdom literature. The book of Proverbs, sometimes James has been called the Proverbs of the New Testament because it's all about living in a wise way. 
Um, here's James talking about wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. We know that biblical wisdom is not being smart or intelligent or a high IQ. Biblical wisdom means uh, living and walking with God faithfully, living a godly life and, and knowing how to live a godly life and doing it actually. Faith turned into action. And that's very much the theme of James, very Old Testament theme in many ways. A second characteristic of James is how oftentimes his wisdom quotes um, are similar to Jesus's. He was clearly influenced by Jesus's teaching. Even if he wasn't a believer, he must have been listening a lot as Jesus preached. There's many allusions to Jesus's teaching, especially the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus's classic sermon in, in Matthew 5 through 7, and, and again, um, repeated in Luke chapter 6. Let me just give you a couple of examples to show you what I mean by parallels. On joy in persevering in trials, James or, or Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. Blessed are those who persevere under trial. Different words, but the same idea. On doing, not just hearing. Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Don't just listen to me. You must do what I say. You must put these words into practice. James says the same thing again and again. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. On blessings for the poor. Jesus said, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. James says, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? On producing spiritual fruit, here's a close parallel. Jesus, again, in the Sermon on the Mount says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? You're gonna know what kind of tree they are by their fruit, by their behavior, in other words. James says the same thing. Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Arguing against hypocrisy, that by your, by your fruits, you'll know, you'll know the authentic salvation you have. Now, the central theme of James, as we said, was faith that works. It's not just saying you believe, but actually putting it into action. And that has actually created some controversy in the church because Paul so emphasizes faith alone brings salvation. And James says, no, 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 you need works as well as faith. And so some people think that James and Paul contradict each other. So we're going to end. We're, we have to cover this theme. It's so critically important for, for, the na for, for the purpose and theme of James. So I want to look at it just briefly and, and talk about how we can easily, quite easily resolve this apparent contradiction. First of all, let's look at the contradiction. Paul says this, for example, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Works don't save you. You can't do anything to save yourself. It's faith alone. James says, on the other hand, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if a person claims to have faith but has no works? Can such faith fa save them? Can faith alone save you? Obviously, the rhetorical question, he say, no, faith alone can't save you. You need works as well. Here's Paul again in Romans 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Not by anything you do, you're saved freely by God's grace. Here's James again. You see that a person is justified by what they do and not by faith alone. So is this a contradiction? Does, does Paul say we're saved by faith and James says, no, we're saved by works? Uh, Martin Luther, uh, the great Protestant reformer in the 16th century, struggled with this because his he, he's so focused on justification by faith, so focused on Paul's theology. He didn't like James at all. He called James an epistle of straw, just nothing there, just straw that would blow away in the wind. Martin Luther was misreading James. He was reading James to the eyes of, of his conflicts and his controversies in his day. Because Paul and James can be brought together and they do bring really unity to this message and two both essential messages. Let me just show you what I mean by this by looking at what, what the two are dealing with. Paul, what, what is Paul dealing with? What, what is he responding to? Well, his opponents we call Judaizers. They're those who are claiming that the works of the law are necessary for salvation. 
So that's Paul's controversy is, is those who are saying that, that Gentiles need to keep the law in order to be saved, do things like be circumcised and to keep the dietary observance. That's, those aren't James' opponents. James is responding to Christians who are saying, I can, I'm saved by faith. I can do whatever I want. I can sin it up. It doesn't make a bit of difference. James says, no way. Because if you've been transformed by God's grace, you're going, to, you're going to do good works. It's going to be the evidence of that. So faith is defined differently by the two. For Paul, faith is true trust and dependence on God, true authentic dependence on God for salvation. For James, faith is mere profession. He says, if you claim to have faith, can that kind of faith that's merely profession save you? That's just words, but if it's not true, a true heart faith, it's not going to save you. By justification, Paul means that God has declared people righteous. It's like a judge. It's a forensic or legal term where based on Christ's death on the cross, God declares us to be righteous. And that's, an extra, that's a righteousness that is, that is um, who we are now as innocent by virtue of Christ's sacrifice for our sins. Paul, uh, James uses the word justification differently. He, he used it the way we often use it to say, I was justified in what I did. I was proven right by what I did. So he would say that, that Abraham was justified, proven right by the offer of Isaac, by his actions. So his faith was shown to be right. Very different definitions of justification, whether a declaration or, or a, a proven act by what we do. Finally, works are different. For Paul, works are attempts to save yourself by your own works, by the things that you do. In other words, they're pre-conversion works, works that get you saved. James isn't talking about that. He's talking about works as the inevitable outworking of faith. If you have authentic faith, then you, it will come out in your actions. So he's talking about believers, works that believers show as proof, as confirmation justification of their, of their salvation. So we see how they're using these two words or all of these various words. We see they're talking and addressing two very different situations. Paul challenging those who claim Gentiles need to do these specific works in order to be saved. James talking about complacent Christians who are saying they can do whatever they want. Well, both Hebrews and James have messages, great messages for us today. Um, in, in our pluralistic society where people say, do whatever you want, anything, any, any religion that makes you happy is, is a good one. Hebrews says, no, God has prepared a way of salvation. His son has sacrificed himself. There is no other way. Persevere in your faith because God has prepared the way and it, there, there's only one true way. James, a message for us as well. We say we believe, we say we attend church, we say, yes, I'm a Christian. How many people in this world claim to be Christians? Yet do they practice what they believe? Uh, do they love the poor and the oppressed? Do they love the outcast and the immigrant? Do you love your enemies? I've been reading about how many young people are leaving the church today. And this, this study was asking, why are they leaving? One of the reasons they're leaving is they don't believe the church believes what it says it believes because they don't see the practice. They don't see the fruit of the spirit. They don't see that love and joy and patience and kindness and goodness coming out because Christians, Christians are claiming to have faith, but then they're acting in the way of the world. They're acting with hatred. They're acting with unkindness. Uh, they're acting with hypocrisy. Followers of Jesus will live out the life that they claim because they'll have been transformed by the Holy Spirit from within. So let's practice what we preach. Uh, let's, let's declare Jesus's message to the ends of the earth. And, and as we go and, and, and meet people, as we encounter people in our daily life, let's, let, let's demonstrate the kind of love that, that Christ showed for us when he came and suffered and died for our sins. So this week, would you think about that? Think about a... Um, how you can share the love of Christ, how you can demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit uh, so that others will see that we are Christians by our love. Would you close your eyes with me as we, we close with a, a word of prayer? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these two letters. Uh, we thank you for the call to faith in Hebrews, the call to perseverance. We know, Lord, when there's temptations um, in our lives, we need to hear that call, that the necessity of, of standing firm in our faith Lord, we thank you for the message of James that, that we need to not just say we believe, but also we need to demonstrate the truth of that salvation in our actions. Help us to be people of faith as well as people of works, demonstrating your love in our love for others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Don't forget on Tuesday evening at 7.30, we have our uh, Good Book Q&A, great time together um, over Zoom. If you don't have that Zoom link, just uh, email Pastor Ken, he'll send it to you. Uh, hope to see you uh, 7.30 Tuesday evening.